about halfway through the semester somehow. Let's, uh, <clears throat> let's give a definition and a few theorems. Um, we'll start with a theorem that will lead to another theorem that will lead to a major definition. Give me a second to kill Microsoft Teams. Okay. If a vector space V has a basis of N vector then any set of more than n factors is dependent. And the argument I'm going to give here is um is a little more informal than the argument in the textbook, because I think the formality of the textbook is kind of obscuring the actual argument. And the actual argument is this. If we have a vector space V and a basis B that has N vectors in it, then the coordinate mapping is an isomorphism. from V to R N. We have a theorem that more than N vectors in R N must be dependent. Like if you have three vectors in R2, that's definitely a dependent set. So isomorphic spaces are indistinguishable. If you can't have more than N vectors in Rn that are independent, you can't have more than N vectors in V that are independent because independence is a vector space definition, and that would give you a vector space way of tethering V and Rn apart. One of them has this large set of independent vectors, while the other doesn't. So that's the argument, and this Maybe I could should call it a lemma instead of a theorem because it's really uh, it really exists to give us the following any two. Let me see. Let's start with this. If V has a finite basis, then any two vectors, what am I saying? 
any two bases of V have the same number of factors. And the proof of this is basically like one or two lines. Suppose you have a basis that contains two vectors and you have another basis that contains four vectors. Okay, here's a basis containing two vectors, previous theorem, any set of more than two vectors is dependent, ergo this set of four vectors is dependent, ergo this set of four vectors actually cannot be a basis because you cannot have a dependent basis. Definition, the dimension of a vector space is the number of vectors in its basis. And that's that, I mean, the way I framed that phrase, that definition is a little informal. I say the number of vectors in its basis, but a vector space doesn't have just one basis. A vector space is going to have an infinite number of bases. But this theorem says, well, they all have the same number of vectors in them, though. You can't have one basis with three vectors and one basis with five vectors. So this is a fairly major definition. Our informal understanding of dimension should be that it's telling us how big a vector space is. I mean, all vector spaces, except the trivial one that only contains zero, but all other vector spaces have infinitely many vectors. Um, if you've seen like countable, uncountable, they're probably going to be uncountable. Um, so you can't really tell them apart in terms of size using that kind of terminology. The dimension gives us a way of talking about how big vector spaces are. A uh, vector space with a large dimension is thought of as bigger than a vector space with a small dimension. So, you know, R is a vector space. The real numbers, it has a basis of one. and it has a dimension of one. R2 is a vector space, 
our intuition is that the plane should be larger than the line, even though they're both unaccountably infinite. That's the standard basis of R2. R2 is dimension two. In general, Rn is dimension n. Um, looking at other vector spaces, let's see, for another example of dimension, it can be a little unintuitive. Our n has dimension n, so it's easy to make a mistake here. The polynomial space P sub n doesn't have dimension n, it has dimension n plus one. And that comes if you look at the basis or a basis, I should say, one x, x squared, x cubed up to x to the n. And you see this set has n plus one vectors in it because of that constant one. Um, by contrast, the space of continuous functions is said to be infinite dimensional because it has no finite basis. And I don't know quite what a proof, uh, what a formal proof of this would look like, but I hope it's intuitive. I mean, imagine if I said the basis were five and there were just, there's this list of five functions. And every other function can be written as a linear combination of these five functions. I mean, that's clearly not true. There is no finite list of functions that's going to make every continuous function as their linear combination. So not every space has a finite basis. The ones that don't are said to be infinite dimensional. We'll maybe talk about infinite dimensional spaces just a little at the end of today's lecture, but overwhelmingly we are in this class going to be looking at finite dimensional spaces. So let me state some theorems. I don't think the following theorem is, is in the book, I guess, or if it is, it's not in this section, I guess, but, but it's important. And this is as good a place to say it as any. Any, and any, Two n dimensional vector spaces are isomorphic. And the proof here as long as we're willing to be a little fuzzy, the proof is really straightforward. Let's say we have V with a basis of B and W with a basis of C. 
then there, then V, there's an isomorphism. Put those brackets in the wrong place. There's an isomorphism from V to Rn. V is isomorphic to Rn. And similarly, this W, this coordinate mapping, is an isomorphism. So W is isomorphic to Rn. And then this is where things are a little fuzzy, but isomorphic spaces are identical from a vector space point of view. So if V is identical to Rn and W is identical to Rn, then surely V is identical to W. And this theorem tells you that as long as you are working with finite dimensional vector spaces, there actually aren't very many of them, and the ones there are, now the one-dimensional vector spaces look like the real numbers. The two-dimensional vector spaces are all isomorphic to R2. The three-dimensional vector spaces are all isomorphic to R3. The four-dimensional vector spaces to R4, and so on. So in a very real sense, if we're restricting ourselves to finite dimensional vector spaces, then the first, very first vector space we looked at, Rn with the column vectors, in a very real sense, those are the only vector spaces. Let's take some other theorems. That's kind of what this section is. It's a bunch of theorems. Um, let's see. Theorem, if H and V are vector spaces, V is finite dimensional. That is, so we'll write the dimension of V is less than infinity when we want to say that something has a finite basis. Now let's say H is contained in V. Um, then H is also finite dimensional and we can uh, do better than that as a matter of fact. The dimension of H is less than or equal to the dimension of V. Furthermore, and this kind of seems like it should be a separate theorem, it's, a, it's sort of its own statement, but any linearly independent set of vectors in H can be turned into a basis of H by adding 
finitely turn that into a more respectable looking eye by adding finitely many vectors. So I don't want to give a formal proof of this. <laughs> Again, because I mean, I mean, obviously there's a lot of formality in mathematics, but I think, again, that a formal proof is kind of obscuring the intuition you should have, which is that the dimension is a measure of size. And of course, you can't have a big object contained inside a small object. If H is contained by V, H cannot be bigger than V. As for this, well, the proof is something like this. We have H, and we've got the, some linearly independent vectors in H. Let's just say we have two of them. Well, if these are already a basis of H, great, we're done, nothing else to do. So assume that they're not. Well, they're linearly independent. So the only way they wouldn't be a basis is if there are vectors that aren't in the span, if they don't span H. So let's say that third dot that I put on the board in the sort of southern hemisphere isn't in the span. Um, well, we'll take it and we'll add it to these vectors. That's our goal specifically. We're going to create the basis by adding vectors to the linearly dependent set, independent set. If these three um, vectors are a basis, great, we're done. If they're not, well, this definitely, I mean, this set of three vectors is definitely linearly independent. Um, because, I mean, because this vector we're adding wasn't in the span of the original two vectors. So if it's not a basis, it means they still don't span H. Find a vector that's not in the span. Either this is a basis or it's not, and we keep going. But we can't keep going forever because H is contained in V and V is finite dimensional. And we cannot have um, more, like, let's write this down. The dimension of V is an upper bound to the number of linearly independent vectors in V, which is just an extremely wordy way of saying of stating this theorem. Uh, we cannot have more than n linearly independent vectors. So we're thinking of being in H, but H is contained in this set V. 
union. And these vectors that we're adding to this basis of H are also vectors in V. So this process can't keep going forever because there's an upper bound to the number of vectors we can add and still be linearly independent. So at some point, this adding vectors process has to terminate. And when it terminates, we have a basis. Um, and this, allows us more or less immediately to strengthen this theorem. If H does not equal V, then in fact, the dimension of H is strictly less than the dimension of V. And the argument by way of contradiction, suppose the dimension of H equals the dimension of V, even though H is not equal to V. So we've got some basis of H that say that they're both uh, five dimensional. That's the picture I've drawn. Okay, well, V is a subspace of V. So I'm going to just erase H and I'm going to say, well, V is a subspace of V. According to this theorem, you know, V is a subspace of V, V is finite dimensional. Any linear, the independent set of vectors in V can be turned into a basis of V by adding finitely many vectors. Well, now you've instantly got a problem because if you're going to turn this into a basis of V by adding vectors, suddenly, V has, has more than five vectors as a basis. So in fact, the dimension of V was bigger than the dimension of H. I guess that wasn't really a proof by contradiction. It's just, if you've done the proof sort of, maybe that's always the first thing I go to by instinct because it gives you a, a starting Let's see. So here's a nice theorem. Say V is N dimensional. And let M, let's say, consist of N vectors of V. This theorem has two parts and it says that if M spans V, M is a basis. 
and two, if M is linearly independent, M is a basis. So how should we understand this theorem? Well, being a basis of V, there are two conditions that M would have to satisfy to be a basis. It would have to span V and it would have to be linearly independent. Um, and what this theorem says is that as long as M has the right number of vectors in it to be a basis, we only need to check one of the two basis conditions. If it satisfies either of the basis conditions, then it satisfies both of the basis conditions, and it is in fact a basis. This is a really nice theorem. Um, I mean, I, I've actually used this theorem in my lectures, although I never said that. But last week, I was, you know, I was saying, okay, let's say we're in R2, and will that five, seven, comma, two, negative one, be a basis. And then I'd say something to the effect that this really is a basis um, and that I'm not going to prove that it's a basis, but that you should don't trust me. Well, how did I know it's a basis? Well, Let's see, is this set linearly independent? There are only two vectors in it, so it's linearly independent as long as one of the vectors isn't a scalar multiple of the other. So when I was creating this basis, I was saying to myself, well, these vectors are independent. R2 is two-dimensional, there are two of them, so two linearly independent vectors in a dimension two space are a basis according to part two of this theorem. And I didn't need to ask myself, but do they span R2? Do they satisfy the first condition? I knew they would automatically. So this is a nice theorem, and let's see. Can I give a proof of it? I can certainly try. Let M be linearly independent. If M is not a basis add vectors to M until it is a basis. I am using the theorem on frame nine here. Um, in particular, we often, often when we are using this theorem, H and V are the same thing space. So every vector space is a subset of itself. So I'm applying this theorem 
where h equals v. Okay, so now we have, let's see, more, because this basis is linearly independent, and we created it by adding vectors to M, and M already had this many vectors in it. So we have more than N vectors in an N dimensional space. And this is a contradiction. Let me try to find the exact theorem it contradicts. Not this one. This one, it's an n-dimensional space. So any set of more than n vectors is dependent. So creating this set of, this basis of more than n vectors is a contradiction. It violates the theorem on frame of one. That's half of a proof. Say that M spans the space. Let's see. Suppose by way of contradiction, M is not a basis. Then the theorem we're going to cite here is a theorem from last week. It says if we've got a set, I mean we and we didn't use the word, the phrase finite dimensional last week, but we had a theorem that basically said, if you're in a finite dimensional space and you've got a spanning set that isn't a basis, that means the spanning set is not independent. And we can turn the spanning set into a basis by picking vectors out. So it was a theorem from the previous week that we could do this. And why is that a problem? Well, V is n-dimensional. M had n vectors in it. So if we create a basis by taking this set with M vectors and kicking some of them out, we create a basis with fewer 
ਤਨ ਤਨ vectors and that's a contradiction because all bases have to have the same number of vectors in them in particular every basis has to have n vectors in it so we cannot have a basis with fewer than n vectors Any questions so far? Then let's see. We can find the bases of null and column spaces. So we can certainly find the dimensions of null and column spaces. Just find the bases and count the number of vectors. As a theorem, the dimension of the null space of a matrix tricks is the number of free variables in the equation it, it's awkward sometimes you want to talk about free variables and then it's but what variables, there isn't any equations, you just have this array. So it's the number of free variables you get when you solve AX equals zero, which is the number of non pivot columns, of A. That's a cleaner definition that doesn't require you to write down this equation, AX equals zero. Meanwhile, how did we find a basis of the column space? Well, a basis of the column space is gotten by taking all of the pivot columns. So the dimension of the column space is the number of pivot columns. Uh, this gives us uh, a fairly famous theorem. Um, I guess I can state it now. I mean, we've, we've got all of the information we need. I mean, this is basically the rank theorem. We'll come back to that word rank in the next section, but the rank theorem basically says that the dimension, let's try that D again, the dimension of the column space of a matrix plus the dimension of the null space of a matrix equals the number of 
columns in the matrix. And this is because every column is either a pivot column or it isn't. And the pivot columns are getting counted in the dimension of the column space, and the non-pivot columns are getting counted in the dimension of the null space. As I say, we'll come back to that. Let's ask a question, though, since we're on the topic of dimension. And, you know, therefore, on the topic of bases, does every vector space have a basis. We've seen vector spaces that don't have finite bases. Um, the vector space of continuous functions was the example we gave. So it's an interesting question. It doesn't have a finite basis, but does it have some kind of infinite basis? And the answer to that question is now widely understood to be a yes. But, um, but this was part of quite a, uh, quite the controversy in the history of mathematics. Um, because the argument that every vector space has a basis uses something called the axiom of choice, and it's non-constructive. And what I mean by non-constructive is we can say a basis exists but we cannot describe it necessarily and we cannot say what functions are in the basis or aren't in the basis all that we can say is that a basis exists. And um, I mean, for a, for a long time, I mean, that, that sort of thing was thought to be unsatisfactory to a large number of mathematicians. Um, because what's the use that's of saying something exists if you can't say anything about it? I mean, especially in France, which remains today, but especially was a few centuries ago, one of the major powerhouses in mathematics, like with people like Poincaré sort of leading the, the way in mathematical research. And it sort of relates to the question of what does it mean to say that a mathematical object exists? I mean, what's it mean to say that the set of natural numbers exists? You can't list the natural numbers. I mean, you can't actually write the set down. And what they came up with, this philosophy called constructivism, was, well, something exists if you can describe it. If you can say, you know, here's a thing, here's a collection, this is what's in it, this is what isn't in it, then that collection exists. And that's 
the exact opposite of this. So it, it was quite the uh, quite the fight. I mean, people people got really worked up over it, and you know, sort of right outraged papers that such and such a mathematician is trying to destroy the foundations of mathematics. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed. Um, it was observed that constructivism gives you some really, really unintuitive results. Like constructivism says you can take the Cartesian pro product of infinitely many spaces, infinitely many sets, and have nothing in that product, even though none of the sets are empty, because, well, because if all that we're telling you is that none of the sets are empty, we're not describing the contents of the set, so how can you describe an element? It was a whole thing. Very funny. Never let anybody tell you that math is a universal language, but this is... This is where, this is the side that won, basically. Um, so we would say that every vector space has a basis, even if we can't describe it or say anything about it. So that's the end of this section.